it is cool. Uh, happy October. Much later in October than I meant for it to be, uh, you know, for my first video, for my first episode of this month. Um, I spent a lot of the time just sort of going back and forth on what I should actually do an episode on, and it's kind of funny what I wound up deciding was very recent because I only uh, picked this particular book up a couple days ago when I went to my very first ever real convention con. Uh, hi, there's my kitten. Hi, Wednesday. Um, uh, Hellcon. The, the second annual. I missed the one last year for unspecified reasons. But anyway, so it was really cool. Um, a lot of cool special guests and stuff, and it was just really overwhelming. People in costumes, all sorts of great stuff, and um, I could probably do a whole episode talking about that, but I don't know. Uh, the main thing for me was getting to see one of my heroes, uh, a writer, a giant in fantasy fiction, R.A. Salvatore, who wrote many of the books up here, uh, most known for the uh, the dark elf hero, uh, Driss Durden. Uh, meeting him was a, just a huge thrill. I just babbled some stuff out to him and shook his hand and told him how much his books meant to me. His son, who also writes, was there with him. Um, another person I met that it was really great to meet was uh, Darwin Cook, uh, Canadian comic book writer and artist extraordinaire, and we got him to sign some things and chatted with him a bit too, and he was incredibly nice. But anyway, so, uh, as you might imagine, a place like this, especially being my first one, I did spend quite a bit of money on, on uh, things, but I think uh, they were well thought out things, and uh, some of the things where, you know, I wouldn't be able to get them otherwise. And one of them is the subject of today's episode, which is Spider-Man, uh, Craven's Last Hunt, also known as Fearful Symmetry. This is the first edition version, which was released back in 1989, and I don't think it is very easy to, uh, come by these days. They, they, they had a re-release of it in 2007, in a Marvel premiere classic, I believe. And that's the one that, most, that is most widely available. I'm not saying this is super rare or anything like that, but still, it's decently rare. So getting it and getting it the price I got was pretty good. So this is the late 80s. This is by uh, writer J.M. DeMatteis, who uh, would write a lot of good Spider-Man going into the 90s. Uh, maybe perhaps most notably during the whole mess that was the Clone Saga and stuff. He wrote, I believe it was issue 400 of Amazing Spider-Man which featured then the death of Aunt May, which many people thought was a, a beautifully, brilliantly written comic. It had, like, I've read it too, and I have to agree. Just a wonderful uh, just a wonderful tribute to the character, and it was very sensitive and very tastefully done. Uh, everything about what that death and what her life had meant to him up to that point and stuff. I just thought it, I have to agree with the people. I've read some stuff on the internet by various people who have the same opinion that it was just a wonderful comic. Uh, Dematius also was one of the more forward-thinking, I think, type uh, writers in the 80s. He also is best known, f very well known for uh, a graphic novel or, yeah, a series of comics. I, I think there were 12. I own them all, actually. It's kind of funny. Um, Moonshadow, which was released on Marvel's Epic imprint, and I think I'd like to talk about that someday because it is so different and so interesting. It was billed back then as a fairy tale for adults, and it's... Um, well, very far from, you know, superhero fare, and it's great, and uh, someday I will probably do an episode on that. It's kind of funny, because that might be the rarest thing I own, again, something by Dematius. And um, the art is by Mike Zeck, who is not a name I'm not familiar with, although I know he wrote um, the Secret Wars crossover for Marvel back in 1984, or drew, drew the Secret Wars crossover for Marvel back in 1984. Anyway, um, I really do love the art in this. This features Spider-Man in his black costume, not the symbiote. I, I believe it's shortly after uh, the separation. I think that's something that I had taken for granted for years before I actually read the comics. I always thought that once this, he discovered the symbiote, you know, what it was and what it was doing to him and managed to successfully separate himself from it, I thought he went right back to the red and blue costume, but he didn't. He had just a he had just a fabric black costume for a while before finally deciding to switch it when Venom showed up. So this is that. Okay, so Craven, of course, is one of the original, well, you know, original Spider-Man villains from the 60s, invented by um, Stan Lee and probably Steve Ditko. Uh, I'll check that just to make sure I'm, I made a mistake there. And so, by the late 80s, you know, that he's been one of Spider-Man's, you know, greatest foes. Despite the fact that he's power-wise, he doesn't really match up to Spider-Man, even with enhanced stuff. He's more like Captain America, more like a, more like, yeah, a peak human than a superhuman. But still, one of the things that gave Kraven his edge was, um, his killer instinct, his, his, uh, 
his amazing experience in the world of savagery and jungle and stuff like that. But, and, uh, so he was always, you know, a pretty good Spider-Man villain, but what this comes up to is that he, he really hates that he always came up short against Spider-Man. And really, the, the main story being told here is just what obsession can do to a human being. Um, also, it, also, in the background at first, and then weaving into the main plot, is the, is the character Vermin. A sort of, ha sort of half-man, half-rat type creature that Spider-Man had tangled with before. Uh, he's a very tragic figure, sort of like a Frankenstein thing, in that, you know, he doesn't really want to hurt anybody, but he's... Most of his mind is gone. He's more animal than man. He just wants to be left alone. But of course, what he's doing in this is he's, um, because he's hungry, he's going up onto the streets. He hides out in the sewer and he's killing people to eat them. And it's, again, it's not because of any sort of malice on his part. It's just all he knows how to do. So what happens here, uh, I don't know how to treat spoilers and things like that, but I mean, the main gist of this is that Craven more or less manages to catch Spider Man by surprise in an encounter and shoots him apparently for dead, and Spider-Man is just so surprised by this after he's, after he's tied up or incapacitated, he's thinking, I know how this works with these villains, he'll, you know, drag me to some abandoned warehouse and rant and rave for a while, and by then I'll get my strength back and I'll break out, and, but then he sees Kraven just pointing a rifle straight at him, and he thinks, what is going on here, because it just seems so different that Kraven's just going to point blank shoot him and end it like that. And of course it turns out to be more complicated than that, he shoots him with some sort of uh, dart or drug or something that, you know, Craven has access to all sorts of weird weird drugs that he makes with uh, with herbs and stuff like that. He often ingests them himself so that he can um, hunt more effectively. Of course, this also makes him sort of deranged because he kind of hallucinates throughout some of it as well. So anyway, and what he does is he buries Spider-Man alive, and that's really the big thing about this. He, and I'm sure you've seen images of it before if you know anything about Spider-Man, the whole... Spider-Man in the grave with the, the tombstone that says, Here lies Spider-Man slain by the hunter. But for Kraven, he thinks this is actually better than killing Spider-Man because the whole idea is to defeat Spider-Man completely and then take his place and do a better job of it. Uh, the art is very nice. Throughout, you'll always see actual spiders. They're uh, just a motif uh, that returns and returns in this because often Kraven likes to refer to Spider-Man as not a man but some sort of embodiment of the spider, because you know, Craven obviously has this understanding of the animal kingdom and stuff like that. Um, so Spider-Man goes out and he's defeated, so then we have, while well, he's supposedly dead, we have Craven dressed as Spider-Man, dealing out very uh, rough justice to some thugs here, and actually this is saving Mary Jane, and that's how she very quickly realizes it cannot be Peter in the suit because he's so brutal in it. Later on he even does kill a criminal. But um, before that, he has a confrontation with Vermin. He sees, when he reads the papers about Vermin's activities, he sees it as a perfect opportunity to prove his superiority to Spider-Man is, you know, take down Vermin. Because Spider-Man, in his last encounter with Vermin, the only way he managed to do it was with he had help. Captain America helped him. And uh, again, you say, well, Spider-Man's more powerful than Kraven. How is, and, you know, he's stronger and faster and stuff. How is it that he could um, succeed where Spider-Man didn't? And I think it is a pretty good question, but I think it's also, it's not like it hasn't been thought through. Again, Vermin, I think it's his savagery that really separates him from other villains that Spider-Man might fight, his animal instincts and stuff like that. And I think just because Craven has a better understanding of that, they have a, just, he just, he's just more equipped in dealing with it. You'll see a nice shot here where after they have a, a bit of a tussle and they separate, you see them both in their corners and they're both growling something Spider-Man wouldn't do, so I think it's, I think that's why Kraven manages to do it, because he manages to match the savagery and, and animal instincts of uh, Vermin. So to me, I think that's very satisfying, it makes a lot of sense. So it's a six-issue arc, uh, it was also notable because it didn't run through all one uh, title. There were three Spider-Man titles at the time, and this was the first time a storyline ran through all three, that would be Amazing, Spectacular, and The Web of Spider-Man. What's funny is that we're used to that nowadays, but back then, people, some people were kind of upset about it because, not, because a lot of people only collected one of them and was upset and thought it was sort of a cheap trick, a cheap ploy on, on Marvel's part to, you know, make everybody have to uh, collect all three if they wanted to get the whole story. 
But at the same time, it, it was a, it was a, I think, a good move as far as continuity goes. It didn't make much sense to have Spider-Man doing things in amazing and spectacular and web that in no way synced up. It made it seem like Spider-Man was three separate people instead of one. So it was significant for that, and also a good thing. They caught flack for it for a bit, and they did apologize. But as we nowadays, of course, we're just really used to that sort of thing. Um, anything else to say about it? Also, another thing that they caught flack about was. If you didn't know, and I guess I'll do a big spoiler here because it's supposed to, it is his last hunt. Um, of course, Spider-Man, uh, predictably, he does get out of this thing. Uh, you know, uh, Vermin is captured, and what happens with Craven is that Craven doesn't even want to fight Spider-Man anymore. He feels like he's already proved his point, and now he can die with honor. And for him, that's everything. And what he does do is he he shoots himself, commits suicide. And apparently they did catch some flack from certain people, too, that said that they were sort of glorifying suicide because Craven was going out on his own terms and talked about honor. But again, that's sort of a weak argument on the part of those people because it's very clear throughout this that Craven is a man obsessed. He's, in, he's uh, ingesting hallucinogenics, and, you know, he's also, a, you know, a crazy criminal who's done all sorts of terrible things. So this is not a... a these are not the actions of a sane, rational person. I don't think it's, it would tell anybody... You know, if you're feeling bad or whatever, that suicide is a great answer because Craven did it. So I think that's sort of a weak argument on that part. Um, usually I talk longer, but, uh, you know, I'd rather be more succinct than just repeat a bunch of stuff and, and give you, and give you, you know, uh, a blow by blow what happens. A lot of the stuff is done with caption boxes, which, again, we see a lot now, but it wasn't done so much back then, so that was sort of interesting. There's a lot of inner narrative going on. And um, it's sort of choppy sometimes, and because um, it's supposed to really reflect, you know, how your thoughts sometimes work, especially when you're in a, a dangerous or crazy emotional situation. So uh, there's some stuff in the back of this issue where they, an afterward, where they just sort of talk about some of the problems they had and some of the themes and things like that. I love the picture of J.M. DiMatteis, because it's just so perfect. It's just all the pictures I've ever seen of him. He just looked nuts. He's got a big, bushy mustache. He's always wearing sunglasses any picture I see. Uh, it's funny. I don't know. But um, this was a very important storyline in Spider-Man. I thought it was important to talk about some Spider-Man, since I don't know if I really ever have. But I wanted to bring up something that I talked about, I think, like two years ago. It was the Kevin Smith story, uh, Daredevil, Guardian Devil. And at the time, I didn't want to use spoilers for that, and I tried my best not to, but spoiler alert for what's going on here is a very similar thing, I think, and uh, he, Kevin Smith even acknowledges it towards the end, except that with Mysterio, that is the bad guy in this, Mysterio is, that Mysterio doesn't actually have much of a feud with um, Daredevil. He just chooses Daredevil because he's uh, aware that the Spider-Man running around was Ben Riley and did not want to deal with that, so he just sort of adopted a nemesis in Daredevil. But it was sort of, still sort of the same idea. It wasn't, just, it wasn't just about killing his enemy, it was about, you know, breaking him down and humiliating him, doing everything he could. And in the, and in the end, he even says something like, I took this bit from Craven, and he shoots himself too. So that's a little nod on Kevin Smith's part. So it just shows how a story like this and some of his themes of, have resonated over the years, and it's still a very significant story. It's a very well-written story, well-crafted, very satisfying art. Spider-Man looks really good in his black costume. I even think, it's hard to tell, I'm not sure, but to me at least it could just be my brain telling me that when Craven's in the costume, he does look a little more broad-shouldered and a little more bulky than Spider-Man, but maybe I'm just imagining that and he drew him the same way. I mean, here we have them both in costume, facing each other off, and the differences aren't necessarily apparent. Of course, Craven's not wearing his mask. Um, another thing that's important about this is, oh, uh, Craven dies here. It shows that his legacy would just keep going. He had children and things like that, and it, and it would haunt Spider-Man for years to come. So this is in no way an ending when it comes to Spider-Man's problems and dealing with Craven. So yeah. Uh, I don't know, it's not very Halloween-y, but it is dark, and it's, uh, you know, and we have the black suit and that sort of stuff going on. And I just think it is a really significant um, chapter in Spider-Man's long and storied history, and one that still resonates very well today. It doesn't seem dated in any way. Uh, DeMatteis, again, I think he was ahead of his time as a writer in a, in a lot of ways. I don't think too many writers 
uh, wrote with such um, depth as he did at the time. Of course, there are exceptions. I'm just saying, you know, among Marvel, I think he really stood out. And he's had a very interesting career, and you should look him up if you're not familiar with his work, because he's a very talented guy, very interesting guy. And maybe that's all there is to say. Certainly my next episode will be a lot sooner. I kind of dropped the ball for October. But, um, yeah, it's funny that my main uh, hang-up was not being able to decide what to uh, do it on, because it's not like I have any shortage. I just have to reread some stuff so it's a little more clear, so that I'm not just umming and awing through a video and forgetting things the whole time. So I'll, I'll be doing some reading between now and then. All right, awesome. That was great. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys soon. Have a great Devil's Night and Halloween and so forth, and I'll be coming back at you soon. Uh, peace out.